We're so glad you're with us this Sunday. My name is Morgan Gallion, and this is my friend Daniel Gonzalez. Well, Dan, Mother's Day is quickly approaching. Are you ready? <laughs> no, I'm not ready, but you know, a great way to prepare for that is next Sunday, we're gonna have our missions market outside. So we're partnering with a lot of different organizations who are raising money for yeah. their missions initiatives. So they're gonna be selling different products out there, and it's a great time to go get those Mother's Day gifts. If you're a procrastinator like me, you'll be out there <laughs> grabbing something. So be sure and prepare for that. It's gonna be awesome. Yeah, and it's just a great time to support what God is doing in the nations while buying your mom a present. So be yeah. sure to look out for that. Yeah, and today, Pastor Matt Urbaugh is gonna be teaching on Romans 11 and about God's heart for his people and how he desires his people to return to him. So let's ask the Lord to speak to us today through the word that Matt's going to preach. I'm gonna read a Psalm as we just prepare our hearts for worship. And in Psalm 52 verses eight and nine, it says, but I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the steadfast love of God forever and ever. I will thank you forever because you have done it. I will wait for your name for it is good in the presence of the godly. So let's just worship God today for his steadfast love um, because he deserves all of our praise. Good morning, how are you guys doing? Let's stand and worship together. Nothing stands in your way 
doubt and fear must bow now at the mention of your name. Sing, I will, and I will lift my eyes, and you will lift my faith. When you are magnified, my perspective begins to change. You remind me of who you are, and nothing stands in your way.
Amen. That's the truth we need this morning, that even though it may feel like we're surrounded by so many other things, we are surrounded by Him. I don't know what you're going through this morning. If you're feeling that in your heart, I don't know what you're going through, but you are surrounded by Him. In 2 Kings chapter 6, we hear about this prophet named Elisha, and this is a guy who spoke to the people on behalf of God. He was God's mouthpiece. And him and his servant are surrounded by all these foreign armies that are trying to destroy Israel. And his servant goes out and he sees all these foreign armies and he goes to Elisha saying, what are we gonna do? There's so many of them, we're surrounded. But Elisha says, God, would you open my servant's eyes to see what I see? And in that moment, his servant opens his eyes and he sees the protection of the Lord all around them. So it may feel like you're surrounded by so many different things this morning. It may feel like you're surrounded by that anxiety. All these situations, you don't know the way out, but the Lord is saying, I have not forgotten you and I am with you. It doesn't mean it's not gonna be difficult. Sometimes it is gonna be difficult, but he is with you. So be reminded you are surrounded by the Lord and you are not forgotten by him this morning. And that's why it's important that we gather as a people, as a church and proclaim his praises and remind our souls of who he is and what he's doing in our lives. So I'm so glad that you're here this morning. And if you're joining us online, I'm so glad that you're with us and you're online with us. If you need prayer for anything and you're online and you're, you're not here in person, you can scan the QR code on the screen or follow the instructions up there. And one of our staff members would love to pray with you this morning. And if you wanna stay up to date with all the different things going on here across Bridge, sign up for different events, or if you just need prayer for anything, or if the Lord is putting it on your heart to give, you can scan the QR code there on the screen, and it'll take you to a link where you'll have uh, all the events on there and directions for giving. You know, we as a church, as Crossbridge, we want to be a church that goes and makes disciples of all the nations. That's what Jesus has commanded us to do. And you know, one of the cool ways that we're doing that right now is we have a team in Reynosa, Mexico, who are building homes for the homeless. These are people who are the lowest of low in society. And we have sent a team to go tell them, Jesus sees you, he's there and he loves you. And to go build them a home. And they're reaching out to some of the people at the border. It's a very difficult situation there right now. And they're sharing the gospel, showing them what the love of Jesus looks like in action. So let's take a moment, I wanna pray for them. And would you agree in your heart with me? And let's ask the Lord to be with them, to give them wisdom. So Jesus, we, we dedicate that team to you. Would you guide their steps? Give them wisdom, Lord. Give them strength. Give them insight to see things the way that you see things. Give them opportunities to share the gospel, to be the hands and feet in Jesus, to be a blessing to all nations. But they make disciples and show people how to follow you, what that looks like, how to love others, how to pray, how to worship, how to gather together. Lord, would they be faithful? God, would you be with them? Fill them with your spirit. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen. I wanna invite the prayer team to come up. And if you need prayer this morning, maybe there's something going on. Like I was saying earlier, you may feel like you're surrounded by something in your life. Don't be afraid to come ask for prayer. This is something that we do as the family of God. We pray for one another because we're all human and we're all going through things. We all have our struggles. We all face real life. So if you need prayer, there's no shame. Or if you just need somebody to stand with you and pray for something going on, don't be afraid to come and pray with somebody. That's what we do as a community. So let's be reminded of who the Lord is, that you are surrounded by him and that he goes before you and he is your defender. Let's worship.
holds break free by the love you gave come on sing this with me we give you the highest praise you deserve it all you deserve it all
chorus and sing this. You deserve we give you the highest praise. You deserve it all. You deserve oh, faithful shepherd, good leader, there's no one like you. Yeah, just keep singing that out. You deserve it all. You deserve it all. Father, highest praise to you, Lord God. We say it together as a body, Lord. You deserve every ounce of glory, Lord God, that you get from our voices, for you get from our worship, for that you get from our beholding you in this moment, Lord God. Oh God, Lord, that we would be a people who give you the most high praise. Would you put that into our hearts, God? Lord, we wanna bring you glory this morning, Lord God. We're here to receive from you, but we wanna also give back this morning, Lord God, our our attention, our adoration, and our praise. Lord, we ask that you would receive it now because we give it to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You guys can be seated. Yeah, that was great. Well, my name is Matt Urban, the, the pastor of Spiritual Formation, and uh, I'm really excited to preach on Romans 11 this morning, a passage of scripture that I believe is very near to the heart of the Lord. If you could say that, I'm sure you could say that about every passage, but there's, there's something on Romans 11 that the Lord is very eager for his church to get a hold of. You know, Romans 11 marks the end of, like you could break down Romans so far, what we've studied into two sections. You could do Romans 1 through 8 and Romans 9 through 11 as this extra section that we've been going through these past couple weeks. And Romans 1 through 8 is this marvelous, deep exploration by Paul into what the gospel is really all about. And as he is sort of building up this, this arguments he's making, the, the case he's making for the gospel, he, it culminates in in chapter 8, which we spent several weeks on here because it was just so rich, it culminates in this, this act of worship that Paul is giving to the Lord. It says, nothing can separate us from his love. He talks about, in Romans 8, the, the life that you guys have in the Spirit right now. But that's, he says, and as great as that is, that's like a down payment. Because it's a down payment guaranteeing something even greater, the inheritance that you will receive in the future. The future glory, church, that you have coming to you is amazing. That even the Holy Spirit is just the down payment of it. And that is marvelous news indeed, especially because he caps off the chapter by saying, all that great stuff, it is secured, is guaranteed by my everlasting love. And the moment he says that at the end of Romans 8, you can almost hear, you can almost see what Paul's thinking. He's like, I know what they're going to ask about now. They're going to ask about Israel. Because if, if God preserves the promises he makes to his people, they're going to say, well, what about the Jewish people? Weren't they his people? Didn't he make promises to them? And when we're looking at things right now, Paul, it doesn't seem like that the Lord is thriving amongst his people. They rejected Jesus after all. And so in this next section of scripture, Romans 9 through 11, Paul says, well, I'm going to do a deep exploration, a deep dive now into the Jewish people so that you can have an understanding. And just like Romans 1 through 8, it starts to build and build and build into this worshipful act of Romans 8, chapter 9 through 11 does the same thing. In fact, when all is said and done, at the very end of Romans 11, Talk about, we just sang about highest praise. Talk about highest praise. This is highest praise. Paul writes, oh, after, after talking about Israel for three chapters, oh, the depths of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. I mean, he actually writes the word, oh, like how, I mean, how much is he trying to be? Oh, the depths, oh, the riches, oh, the knowledge. When you look at these people, Israel, and you understand what God's plan really is, you can't help but gush forth in highest praise. And I would say that, me included, the church does not have an understanding of the plan and purpose of Israel enough to worship like this. 
Three chapters he devotes to it. And that's a significant amount in the book of Romans. It is important to the heart of the Lord. And so what we're going to look at today is we're going to start to explore Romans 11 in a way that I pray produces in us a similar heart response to what Paul experienced here when he worships in the highest way possible. So today we're going to look at Israel. Who are they? Like, what are, what are God's plans? And I think probably most importantly for us, I'm assuming most of us in this room are Gentiles. What does God want you to do as a part of his plan for the, the Jewish people? And it's significant. Now, when I start to say, hey, we're going to talk a lot about the Jewish people today, there may be a tendency in us to say, well, I'm sure God will all sort that out. I'm sure it's important, but I'm a Gentile. It doesn't really have so much to do with me. I'm going to lean back now a little bit. Like the temptation to think, well, let's think about where I'm going to go to lunch later. Let me, let me urge you, let's not lean back on that, all right? This, this does impact you in a profound way. Let's lean in and listen to what the Lord has to say in Romans 11. And to encourage us in this, as the, as the Word of God so often does, Paul kind of gives us the, the carrot and the stick, right? The carrot to try to, to lure us in to, hey, you want this, right? Come in and enjoy what I'm about to talk about. But also like, hey, you don't want to go, let me, let me get you with the stick a little bit. Let me prod you in. And the stick would be, hey, when you're talking about Israel, be very careful. Because how our hearts are postured towards these people, it matters in a significant way. And if we're postured in a wrong way, Paul warns us, the consequences can be very dire for us. But I'm more of a carrot kind of guy, so what's, what's the carrot? What's the draw me in that way? And the Lord, I think, would say, because it matters to me so deeply, church, the people of Israel are on my heart in such a deep, profound way. And aren't you my bride? Don't you want to love the things that I love? Don't you want to be in deep mourning over the things I'm in deep mourning over? And as a part of that bride, I say, yes, Lord, I want to know what you know. I want to feel the way you feel. And so let's just, even now, we can posture our heart. Lord God, would you posture our heart in the same way that your heart and your eyes are focused on this grand subject matter, the people of Israel. Amen. How do I know that this is on Jesus' heart in such a profound way? Well, you can tell by the way that Paul begins this section of Scripture in Romans 9. He says in Romans 9, 1, listen to this. He says, I am speaking the truth in Christ. And just catch that little phrase, in Christ, for a moment. We're going to come back to that. I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit. Now, when anybody's about to tell you something or tell you a story or tell you a fact and they have to preface it with, hey, well, I promise what I'm saying is the truth. It really is. I am not lying at all. We know what's about to come next would be in the natural something we just couldn't believe could actually be true. And that's what it is. Paul says, I'm not lying about this. But in verse 2 and 3, he says, what is he not lying about? That I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. He's talking about for the Jewish people. For I could even wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. I have such a heartache for the Jewish people, my kinsmen according to the flesh, Paul says, that if I could be accursed and they could be brought in the family instead of me, if they could replace me, I would do it. I mean, what kind of love is that? Can you think of anybody that you would say, I would be willing to go to hell if it meant that they could take my place? I can't think of anybody. That's so precious to me. It's so scary. And not only is this not even for like his family members, even though they're his kinsmen according to the flesh, you got to remember that these are the people who are persecuting Paul right now. Because they are enemies of the gospel at this point in the story. They are trying to stop the message of Jesus. They are certainly trying to stop the chief message giver, Paul. And yet even still, he makes such a powerful statement. Well, how does a man make a statement like that? How can a man love that deeply and profoundly? And that takes us back to that little phrase. It says, 
I am speaking the truth in Christ. So even though Paul is feeling it, even though Paul is saying it, we see the source is not, not Paul. We go back and it's, it's Jesus is the source. It's in Christ that he feels these things. So Paul is revealing God's intense emotion, his unceasing anguish for the Jewish people. And I will say to you that if Jesus feels this intensely, and has this much longing in his heart towards the Jewish people, he will do something about it. I would even go further and say he must do something about it. Because God has made promises to Israel. And the whole argument Paul is making here hinges on the fact that, hey, if, if he makes promises, he keeps them, right? Because if he doesn't keep them for Israel, how can I rest assured in my salvation? How all those glorious promises in Romans 8 about my future glory, how can I really like, stand firm in that if he just breaks promises left and right? And here's the really interesting thing. He will, he is determined to have his way with Israel. He must have his way with Israel. And church, listen to this. He says, I want to include you in the process of bringing them back to me. So again, that's why we need to lean forward this morning because this really does impact you. It impacts the plan of the Lord that we have a right mind understanding of what's going on, but also a right posture in our heart. So once again, Paul, and starting in, in Romans 11, verse 1, he says, I ask, then, has God rejected his people? Is the reason that so many of them are not following Jesus because they've been rejected by God. And Paul emphatically says, by no means. That is not what's happening here. And then he starts to talk about this remnant. There is always, he says, a group of, within larger Israel, there is always a portion that has stayed faithful to God. I'm an example of it right now, he says. And we almost look at it the same way we did in Romans 8, where he says, Gentiles, you have a future that's going to be glorious. And you might say, well, right now it doesn't seem so glorious. Well, he's giving you the Holy Spirit now as a deposit guaranteeing the future glory to come. In the same way, he says, look, everybody, you think that he's rejected Israel. No, he's got his down payment. He always keeps a remnant. He always keeps a group that's faithful to him. Even in the Old Testament, there was a portion where Elijah goes to God and says, I think I'm the only one left. Everybody else is bowing their knees to the Baal. I'm, I'm the only one that follows you. And, and he's quickly corrected, no, Elijah, I am faithful. I have kept a group of 7,000 for myself. It's the promise guaranteed for the future glory when all of the people of Israel will walk faithfully as you do, Elijah. And in the New Testament, Paul says, I'm the example of that now. He always keeps a remnant. And this future glory, and he's like, here's... Here's the, the crazy thing that Paul starts to say. You know why it seems like it's not working out? But this is actually the plan. God has a plan to save all of Israel, but includes a bunch of them having their heart hardened right now. Well, how can that be the plan? That seems like such a bizarre plan. Well, that's why at the end of Romans 11, Paul says, man, his ways are unsearchable. His judgments, you can't, you can't scrutinize them. He does things different from us, but oh, let me tell you, they are glorious the way that he does them. So let's look, at, let's look at the plan a little bit. The Lord really wants us to have an understanding of his plan for Israel. And first we can look at the part where what seems to have gone wrong. And that's, we can look at the way the Israelites received the law. He talks about this quite a bit in Romans 9. You see, the law was given to Israel to say this is what righteousness looks like. If you want to be mine, you need to be righteousness. Here's righteousness. And what that was supposed to do, let me, you can have a little picture up there of the law. What, was, what needed to happen was you look at the law, the intention of it was you would look at it and say, I can't do that. I can't be righteous like this. And it was supposed to drive them to a righteousness that wasn't their own. It was supposed to show them their great need for Jesus as the Savior. But instead of that, that's not what happened. They actually went the exact opposite way. And they said, well, okay, I see this law. I will do this. 
And despite centuries and millennia of failure after failure to do it, they kept saying, we will do this. And when Jesus actually shows up, the grace that they need personified in a man, the righteousness that they need in a man, they didn't accept him because they were too busy wanting to do it on their own. It says that Jesus was like a stumbling stone. And boy, did they stumble over it. They were so offended by him that they actually crucified him. That's stumbling over the stumbling stone. And so in Romans 11, again, we go back to it. It says Romans 11, 1, but it's actually supposed to be Romans 11, 11. So yes, they stumbled, Paul, uh, Paul says. So I asked, did they stumble in order that they might fall? Is that what's going on here? And again, he says, by no means. That's not the end of the story, Paul is telling us. In fact, the fact that they stumbled is a part of the story. There is purpose in it. Okay, we're, Paul, what is the purpose? Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles. And so what he starts to do is he, he starts to show us this picture of like an olive tree that represents Israel. And the roots were the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who founded this people of God. And the branches are like the, the present Jewish people, but they have stumbled over the stumbling stone and they have basically been cut off of the tree. Why? So that he could graft in these other branches that aren't a part of the tree. They're wild olive shoots he's going to bring in and attach to this family. And that's us, the Gentile people. And that would completely makes sense to even Jewish believers at the time because they knew that the, the blessing of being in the family of God started with the Jewish people, but the intent was always for it to spread and be a blessing to the rest of the world. And he's saying, that's actually happening, just not in the way you thought. You probably thought in your mind Israel would walk in this great righteousness and by such a great example, everybody else would be like, wow, we got to get in on that. But instead, you stumbled over the stumbling stone. You've been cut off from the olive tree and that is what has made room for the Gentile believers. But the story doesn't end there either, he says. Because in the next part of the verse, he says, the reason you are being grafted in, church, is so that now you can make Israel jealous. It's been 2,000 years since this process of them falling off and the, the Gentile branches being brought in. 2,000 years of Israel not being jealous of us, church. I think there are two reasons for that. One is that he is waiting for the full numbers. We'll see this first in just a second. He is waiting for a full number of Gentile branches to be grafted in. But there's another sense that he means, I'm waiting for the fullness of the Gentiles. He's talking about a fullness that comes in our maturity, specifically towards the Jewish people. So Paul starts to warn us of maybe where the church has gone off a little bit. Romans eleven seventeen. 17. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, although you're a wild olive shoot, you were grafted in among the others. Among the others, because remember, he always keeps a remnant of Jewish believers. There's always some Jewish branches in this tree. And here's what you'll say, verse 19. You'll say, branches were broken off so that I, a Gentile, might be grafted in. Paul says in verse 20, that's true. That's absolutely right. They were broken off because of their unbelief. But you stand fast through faith. So here's a warning. Don't become proud, but fear. Why? Verse 21, for if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. And so we can go back to that picture again of the law with, with the two arrows, right? We can say, hey, remember how when Israel was, uh, uh, they were given the law and they were supposed to go one way, see their need for Jesus, but they actually ended up going the exact opposite way? Well, guess what? They're, they're not the only ones that do that, church. Israel is just our soul, our heart displayed in a group of people. We can honestly say, man, Israel, they are stiff-necked people. Man, they are stubborn. Man, they just don't get it. 
Why? Because that's true of all of us. And in the same way they took the law the exact opposite way, we do the same thing, Paul says, with Israel. Israel, when we see them as a group of Gentiles, he says, you know what that should do for you? You should be overcome with humility. That God would break off some of his natural branches to make room for you? Oh, the wisdom of God. Who can understand it? It should produce a fear of the Lord in saying, if he broke off those natural branches, I better stand firm in my faith. But what it does is we look at them so often in the exact opposite way. Instead of humility, there's pride. Instead of fear of the Lord, there's arrogance. Perhaps you've experienced this as you've read through Scripture and you read through the Old Testament and you're like, they're doing that again? They still don't get it? Or there's Jesus, the guy that's written about throughout the whole Scripture and he finally shows up and he's standing in front of them and they completely miss it? How dense do you have to be? And what we're really saying when we say that is, while they don't get it, I get it. I almost can picture myself standing with the Jewish man before the Lord, and he would say, why should I let you in, Matt, and not this guy? Because he didn't get it. I got it. I'm smart enough to see Jesus in the Old Testament. I'm not standing by faith anymore. I am standing in works. And so Paul warns, don't do that. You have to understand Israel rightly, or again, the consequences could be dire for us. And so part of this problem that we have is we've gone too long, church, with just a casual ignorance about who Israel really is. But Paul wants to remedy that for us. So in verse 25, this is one of the great verses of chapter 11, I want you to understand this mystery. It is mysterious how it all works. I know, Paul says, but I don't want you to be unaware of this mystery. I want you to understand it, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until, and we'll just dot, dot, dot there for a second. In our natural flesh, we're always going to stumble over Jesus. How much more when a group of people is actually hardened for a purpose? But what is that purpose? And how long will this hardening last until, he continues, until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in? There is a set number, Paul says, of Gentiles that will be grafted in. When you think about it, this just changes so much about even how we view the Great Commission. Because we know that when the Great Commission is fulfilled, what does it say? It says Jesus will return. When there is somebody that professes Jesus in every tribe, nation, and tongue, Jesus will return. And he says, the final conclusion, verse 26, and in this way, all of Israel will be saved. He says, you see the process that's going to happen. The fullness of the Gentiles will come in, church. Not just a fullness in number, but we'll talk about this more in a second. A fullness in maturity. And when that happens, and the Great Commission is completed, then all Israel will be saved. Now, when he says all Israel, he's not talking about the Jews of the past. If you died without Christ as your righteousness... The same judgments that would be true of us is true of the Jewish people. There's no difference. There's only one path to heaven, and that's through Jesus. Right? We can all settle that. There is, there's no different way to get there. But God is determined to get them there. And so God says all Israel will be saved. And so let's just, let's just look at the plan here for a little bit. We have a little picture for you, and you could add about 100 different steps into this little picture, but it's just to kind of catch us up here, do a little review. Israel, you probably could start before that and say Israel is promised, has a, has a covenantal promise that they will walk in righteousness. And so step one in walking in righteousness, I'm going to harden you. Only God would do something like that. But through your hardening, the world will be blessed and Gentiles will be grafted in in your place. And there will come a day when there is a full number of Gentiles in and a full maturity in these Gentile people. And when that happens, Jewish people, then you will be provoked to jealousy. And when you are provoked to jealousy, that's when you will be saved when Jesus returns. 
And Paul says, well, there's one thing I don't think that you're getting. You don't, you don't understand how good news this is, not just for the Jewish people, but for you too, Gentiles. Romans 11, verse 12, he says, Now, if their trespasses meant riches to the world, how much greater, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Like, if you guys were blessed by them trespassing and being hardened, think about the blessing that will come when they're included. Well, what blessing is that, Paul? I want to know. Well, he tells us in a few verses down, verses, uh, Romans 11, verse 15, for their rejection means the reconciliation of the world. What will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? Our future glory, we think about, part of that includes us being resurrected from the dead. A big part of it includes being resurrected from the dead. That won't happen, Paul says, unless the Jewish people are grafted back in. Well, you might say, well, wait, wait a minute. Like, I thought that the resurrection of the dead happened when Jesus returns, and you'd be right. But did you know this? Jesus said in Matthew 23, at the very end of the chapter, verse 39, right before he was leaving the temple for the last time, right before his crucifixion, he turns to the Jewish leaders and he says, you will not see me again. I'm talking about his second coming. You won't see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. There will be a day, he's saying, that you will look at me. And instead of stumbling, and instead of rejecting, you're going to bless my coming. Zechariah 12.10 gives us the picture of that actually happening. He says, I'm going to pour out on the house of David. That's Jewish people. I'm going to pour out on the inhabitants of Jerusalem. That's Jewish people. I'm gonna, what am I going to pour out? I'm going to pour out the spirit of grace. No longer are they going to be hardened. I'm going to pour out my grace on them for a reason. So that, he says, when they look on me, when Jesus pierces the sky and returns and they see him, it says, the one that they pierced, they will mourn. Church, as I said, we cannot afford to be ignorant of the Lord's plan. We can't, uh, we can't allow our heart to be postured in a wrong way towards Israel. Because while we are sometimes ignorant of God's plan, let me tell you who is not. Satan is not uh, uh, ignorant of this plan. And the moment Jesus said, hey, I'm never going to come back unless you Jewish people welcome me back, it's like challenge accepted from Satan. And he has spent the last 2,000 years trying to wipe this people off the map. In AD 70, he got the Romans to kill a million of them. And on through the ages to even just a generation ago in World War II where the demonically inspired Adolf Hitler tried to enact what he called the final solution. Get rid of all the Jews. Have you ever wondered about the just crazy anti-Semitism that exists? Six million Jews. And after that, the Jewish people said, we will never allow this to happen again to us. Never again. But with great sadness in my heart, I say, it will happen again. The time of the end is called specifically the time of Jacob's trouble, the great time of their trouble, like it's never been before. And if you say the trouble for the Jewish people is like it's never gonna be before, that's actually saying something really profound. Six million people, we haven't seen anything yet. But I tell you that there will be a difference this time around. By the word of the Lord, there will be a church who is not ignorant of the plans of God. There will be a church that walks in humility and the posture of love towards these people that we did not see happen in the past. In World War II, this is very, this is, this is hard to even say this. There were a precious few in the church that risked their lives to bless the Jewish people. We have the notable exceptions like Corey Ten Boom. You can read her book, The Hiding Place. Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Sadly, most in the church 
were either complicit in what was going on or just kind of like covered up their eyes and ears and said, we're just going to ignore it. There's a story of a church in Germany during World War II that was right by the railroad tracks. And they were gathered together on a Sunday morning worshiping like we're doing right now. And one of the trains stops, has to stop on the rails right outside of their church. And as they were singing, they could hear the moans coming from the cars of Jewish people on their way to concentration camps. And the pastor stands up and he tells his congregation, sing louder. Block out the noise. Sing louder. Church, we cannot let that be us. But if we walk as we have walked, our default will go to that direction. So we need to make a determination now in our heart to be different. I just want to ask you guys, just close your eyes for a moment. God, we repent, like I said, for our casual ignorance about something that is not casual in your heart. God, we repent of a, a heart of arrogance, and we ask for a heart of humility. And let's just ask the Lord now, Lord, what do you want me to do? I know your plans include me, but I don't know what that means. And so, God, we are asking as a people right now, would you give us an obedience step now, Lord, so that we will walk like the Corey Ten Booms, Lord, so that the exception will become the rule in this church in the name of Jesus. Lord, open our eyes to see, open our hearts to feel about Israel the way that you feel. So, Lord, we just wait now before you and ask for your wisdom and obedience now. And Jesus. You know, that's a good reminder that the Lord is calling us back to himself. And maybe you're feeling like you are far from God today. Well, he wants you to know that he's calling you back that he wants you to return to him and he has those open arms just saying come home to me so maybe this week you need to reach out to somebody and talk about some things that god's stirring on your heart maybe you need to tell somebody about this commitment that you made to jesus to begin following him and receiving every blessing that he has for you so be sure and talk with somebody about the things that god's doing in your heart because it's so important that we stay in community you know we have a couple of things coming up and first thing is this we have our kindle express coming on may 1st it's a saturday and this is going to be a great opportunity to reach out to the city, to pray for people, to learn how to share your testimony and share the gospel and the love of Jesus in San Antonio. We also have our Ablaze Camp coming up this summer, June 12th through the 16th. So if you have a 6th through 12th grader that wants to join us for camp, we're going to Lake Levon in Dallas, yeah. Texas. It is going to be a really awesome time, so be sure to register them as soon as possible. And we have our Celebration Sunday coming up on June 6th, and we're going to have baptisms. So if you would like more information about that, you can email info at crossbridgecommunitychurch.com. All right, we love you guys, and we hope you have a great week, and we'll see you next week. See you later.